Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Cecile Borlasa. Um, I want to thank you for hanging out with us here at C3 Converse, uh, presented by Nielsen, which is part of the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival, presented by Visual Communications. I'm coming to you all the way live from the 562 Long Beach, um, and I want to uplift and acknowledge the Tongva and Kish people who are the original stewards of this land. Um, we are in weekend number five of the festival, and thank you to everyone who has helped make this unprecedented festival possible. Special thank you to all the sponsors, all the community partner orgs who have joined in with us, and a special thanks to all of you who are hanging out with us weekend after weekend after weekend. Um, we're so glad to share the festival with you in this way. You might know that BC, this org, started 50 years ago. Um, it is the first nonprofit organization in the U.S. dedicated to the honest and accurate portrayals of the Asian Pacific American peoples, communities, and heritage through media arts. I invite you to join us to keep it going for another 50 years. So please go to vcmedia.org slash donate to learn how you can help keep it going and celebrate 50 with us. If you don't, oh, um, sorry, wrong part of the script. Now we're gonna get into the next part of our, our C3 Converse Day with a wonderful conversation with C3 Geographies of Kinship. And to lead that conversation is a friend and a dear friend of VC is senior programmer, Lindy Leong. Lindy Leong enjoys supporting community, building and advocacy through the arts. She balances the challenges and joys of being a dilettante in her, in her other lives as a film and media educator, arts administrator and archivist. She cares deeply about building AAPI and BIPOC power in the film and media industries. And much to her chagrin, Netflix and chill is actually the new normal. Please welcome Lindy Leon. Hi everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Seal. Um, I couldn't believe you read my bio on on air here, but um, yes, that's kind of how I feel these days. Uh, I appreciate you guys joining us today for our conversation uh, about the wonderful documentary Geographies of Kinship. Uh, again, my name is Lindy. I am one of the programmers here at the festival. I am zooming in from my home in Silver Lake. Los Angeles, California on the native land of the Chumash, Tonga, and Kish. And I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, if you want to read closed captions today, we'll be dropping a link in the chat now. Uh, so you want to click on that and it will bring up a new window that would open with an audio script. So before I get the conversation started with our special guests, I wanted to acknowledge uh, some of our uh, great sponsors uh, without whom we would not be able to put on this festival year in, year out. And they are the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, um, Sony Picture Entertainment, Comcast NBC Universal, the California Arts Council, SAG AFRA Producers, um, Industry Advancement and Cooperative Fund, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, and last but not least, HBO and Warner Media. So I wanted to thank them and our community partner uh, organizations for their valuable work and for their continued support of visual communications, which is celebrating its 50th year uh, this year. So without ado, I wanna welcome our, our two special guests uh, and, um, and bring them on and we'll have a lovely conversation. And they are uh, director Diane Borchet Lim and one of the key subjects in her film, Dr. Excel Cope Samson. So ladies, could you uh, turn on your camera and unmute yourselves? Hi. 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 Hi, everybody. Hi. Oh, Estelle, will you, yes. uh, can you turn on your video and unmute yourself? I think you will. Hi, Hi Estelle. Good <laughs> afternoon. I love your backgrounds. Uh, I have, unfortunately, I have my, my branded background here. So we are doing our C3 conference. Um, so I, first of all, I just wanted to see how you guys are doing. Uh, we are, uh, and thank you for coming today to talk about your uh, project. Um, this is such an unprecedented time. We are in pandemic autumn season right now. And um, I, I, I'm very happy that you were able to join us and uh, today and have this film in our festival slate this year. So I, I wanted to ask, first of all, where, um, well, first of all, I just want to acknowledge uh, Deanne um, and as a, just thank her for joining us because I actually am very honored to be interviewing you today because I know you're such a been such a leader and creator in the AAPI documentary space, uh, in your work, in your independent documentary work, and also your work at uh, the Center for Asian American Media, our sister organization, which is celebrating 
40th year, it's 40th year today. So I wanted to acknowledge that, first of all, thank you. And I'm really delighted to have uh, Dr. Estelle uh, Coke Samson here, who's a key subject in the film. And I would love to talk a little bit about your story and how it fits into Pian's project. Um, so maybe I, I, could, I can kick it off with the first question here, which is kind of a general question um, for Deanne. And then I'll move into asking mm -hmm. Estelle about uh, your participation in the film. So, I mean, you, you're no stranger, Deanne, you're no strangers to the topic you're, you're, um, you address in Geographies mm -hmm. of Kinship, which is about the, the phenomenon, you know, that some people, that definitely a lot of people coming into the talk today know about Korean adoption uh, and it's uh, in, in kind of intertwined history of Korean adoption with uh, American, uh, the, you know, American cultural, uh, you could say imperial, uh, uh, I guess, for history, uh, um, the histories mm -hmm. of uh, American politics. Um, can you talk, especially in your film, your seminal film, uh, First Person Plural, and in the matter of uh, Cha Jong-hee, his previous project also dealt with histories and um, stories of Korean adoptee. How does this, this latest project fit into your larger investment, uh, not only in the topic, also, but also as a, as a documentarian? Mm -hmm. um, well, first... About that. <laughs> Okay, sure. Um, first, I just want to say thank you, um, Lindy, and thanks to Visual Communications for having um, this film in the festival. Um, I was really looking forward to having the festival in person in May, and of course was disappointed when it got canceled, but was delighted to um, uh, find out that you were going to do this as a virtual festival. So um, thank you for that. And also congratulations to VC on its 50th anniversary. Uh, it's an amazing accomplishment, um, and uh, VC has done so much for our community of filmmakers. So thank you for all of the work and um, wonderful programming that um, VC has done over the years. Um, and thank you, Estelle, for joining us. Um, it's wonderful to have Estelle here. Um, so, um, you know, I've made two prior films about transnational adoptions from Korea. Both of them were personal. Um, uh, and uh, over the course of making those films, um, you know, I traveled to various places around the country and around the world screening those films and just met so many different adoptees, um, Korean adoptees, um, you know, from France, from Belgium, Luxembourg, Sweden, all over the world, Italy. Uh, and I was just struck by how, um, I was just struck by like, how did we all get to where we were? And um, because, you know, when I was growing up, I thought I was like the only Asian kid growing up in a white family. I didn't know that there were about 200,000 others around the world. Um, and so that really made me um, interested in learning more about the history, because I think as adopted individuals, um, it's not something that we learn from our families. Um, oftentimes our records are um, quite confusing, if not faults. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's hard to piece those things together. And I think each of the prior films touch on history, but it's really, it doesn't really go into detail about um, the history, you know, beginning with the war through kind of the present. So I decided to take on more of a historical look uh, at that experience. Um, so I no, thank you for that uh, insight. Uh, I figured that, yeah, I saw, I mean, I noticed that the ambitious scope of this film differs from your previous more personal work. And I, I saw that as kind of this continuing, uh, this dialogue that you're having um, and, and also continuing, uh, continuing the research that you've embarked on your previous project and kind of like bringing, painting a larger canvas. So with, with, I, I'm just curious to see thinking with that in mind, what was the, I guess this is like an easy filmmaker production question, like what, what was the impetus for this particular project? I mean, you've had these two uh, uh, other projects done. Um, what, 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 what kind of lit that kind of uh, fuse to kind of get this particular project um, on, mm -hmm. uh, started? You know, I think that as um, adopted individuals, as I was saying, you know, we don't often learn our history. Um, I think um, certainly when, you know, especially the period of time when I arrived in the U.S., you know, it was really all about assimilation, assimilating into our adoptive families and forgetting the past. And at the same time, I think in, in South Korea, um, 
some 200,000 children were adopted overseas um, and they all had mothers and fathers and grandmothers and you know possibly siblings and so millions of families were impacted by transnational adoption in South Korea and yet people don't really know um, know much about it why why it, it began and and kind of the whole historical trajectory uh, starting with um, the Korean War and so I think in in part in part I think I felt a very strong desire to um, integrate, kind of knit together our personal stories with the history of um, kind of post-war South Korea, as well as kind of the, um, the, the movement, the various ways in which families in the United States were being formed through adoption. And so part of it, I feel like, is kind of reinserting Korean adopt adopted individuals back into K South Korean history, and also um, trying to build a collective knowledge base for ourselves as an adopted community. Well, that's, that's wonderful and admirable and much needed. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I kind of uh, saw that a bit while watching this film uh, a few times, uh, that that's what you were uh, striving to do. So you, 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 you know, the film is ambitious, definitely, and I feel like you can make you can actually do more, you can even kind of continue this project with other, uh, interviewing other um, adoptees, uh, kind of in an oral, like a series of oral histories. I, I feel like that, that's the context, yeah. background of that. Uh, but you chose to, chose to highlight four adoptees, of which Estelle is one of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, you know, like I know you talked about the historical timeline, uh, kind of tracking the cultural, political change and transition in South Korea. Uh, from the time of the Korean War in the 19, 1950s to the present day, um, I, w I wonder if you were um, intentionally set on like just kind of narrowing your scope to like maybe like key adoptee interviewees, uh, or were you kind of like more like uh, uh, I guess pulled into maybe the the research and materials you were able to find because there is a lot of material. Um, you, you have a lot of the ac academic talking heads that were really wonderful and the, the rich archival footage photos and news broadcasts and even like shooting on the various location from the US to Europe and uh, uh, and South Korea. Um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about like kind of actually kind of the nitty gritty of the production mm -hmm. uh, process? Yeah, um, you know, I started, I started with doing a lot of research. Um, I read everything I could about <laughs> adoption and especially um, Korean transnational adoption. And there's a, a quite um, a robust um, adoption studies, uh, I guess, discipline now that you, you could call it adoption studies discipline. So a lot of um, scholars are working on, on, on these issues. And so there's wonderful scholarship to refer to. Um, there are also some archives that I visited, including the social welfare archive in uh, Minnesota. Um, and um, anyway, there, there were a lot of history um, and trying to understand also uh, Korean War, the Korean War and post-war history of South Korea. So it was a complicated, um, for me, since I'm not a historian, it was sort of a complicated uh, effort. Um, I also did some, a lot of um, research interviews with adoptees, both in the US and in Europe, um, both uh, recorded either just audio or video. And I also recorded, filmed um, more people than actually are in the final film and could not um, unfortunately include everybody that I had actually filmed. And, um, but I think in the end, what I ended up doing is um, looking at what were the key moments of history and what were the ways in which um, Korean adoptees started to develop a sense of agency. Um, and I think that, you know, as children adopted overseas, we also, you know, um, we all often feel like we had no say in our fate, that we had no sense of agency or control. But as, ad as adults, um, I think adoptees started rewriting that their own, you know, narratives and started um, telling their own stories and becoming active in terms of um, adoption policy and um, just having an influence um, in how the adoption narrative is developed. So I wanted to, to, to show that progression. Um, and I think that all of the adoptees, including Estelle, um, 
uh, you know, um, develop a sense of not only discover their own personal stories, but also start seeing how their personal stories fit into this larger sociopolitical historical context. And I think that's a really important thing for, for us as a community to understand our history. Um, because I, I, I really feel like without understanding um, how we came to be, who we are and, and where we are, that um, it's a very limited um, you know, sense of identity. So, um, you know, the film took a very long time to make. I met Estelle years ago. <laughs> it feels like I've known Estelle all my life. But, you know, we met so many years ago and filmed interviews. I filmed um, interviews with Estelle and then we filmed various scenes over the years. And um, she's been very patient with me. But, you know, it was a complicated, complicated story. Uh, and I think one of the main challenges was actually integrating the historical sequen sequences with the personal stories because I, I didn't want it to be just pure history. I wanted to I wanted um, the audience to be able to connect to individual adoptees and um, understand what their personal experiences were. So it was a complicated uh, edit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can tell. I mean, I, I was wondering about the editing. I was watching the film and like what what got left on the on the on the on the cutting floor, mm -hmm. as they say. And oh. <laughs> I, I wanted, yeah, I know. I, I felt like there was a lot of story you probably recorded and 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 didn't mm -hmm. include just because you're, yeah. you're constructing a film, you're making a documentary, and you're not writing an academic history book so, per se. Uh, I wanted to bring Estelle into the conversation, learn a little bit more about your participation in the film. I. I it's good to know that you both know each other for such a long time and have that mm -hmm. shared history. I'm sure that helped in crafting this film. Um, the, I just want to talk about the, the, your feature subjects who are like, who, I was really moved by all four stories that were highlighted. And uh, your story, Estelle, is really unique because you're one of the mixed race kids that were adopted to the US. And this, was a, this, was a situ this is a particular thread in the documentary that you talk a lot about, um, uh, Deanne, and also, mm -hmm. um, talk about growing up as a mixed race kid um, who was didn't who was set, um, removed from the Korean culture because you came to the U.S. Uh, like really really early on and it's kind of very very much assimilated into American uh, into the, you know as an American child. Can you talk can you talk a little bit for, for our audience guys, especially for those who haven't seen the film about um, yeah like your your upbringing in that context uh, up to yeah up to participating in this film uh, today. Um. Oh, Lindy, thank you so much for having me. And I want to thank Deanne because what I understand, she could only allow one person. And certainly the other uh, the other individuals in the film, I think their story is just as strong and as, as wonderful. Their narrative so is very uh, wonderful. Um, and I want to thank the sponsors. I, I want to thank everyone uh, who is making this possible today. The oral history of any individual and especially a particular culture is very, very important. Now, going back to my particular story, I was adopted. I was almost, you know, this is the problem because the lack of accurate records, I would say I must have been, uh, you know, about six about six and let's keep it that for the social security record okay because i plan on getting my social security on time but anyway um i did not have birth certificate and it's very interesting i was adopted by an african-american uh, soldier who was enlisted and he took me out the orphanage it was a large orphanage in in seoul at that time, even as a little child at the orphanage, I knew I was a little different. Not so much as color, but just the way you were treated. And, um, and by the grace of God, he, he selected me. And it wasn't an orphanage for adoption. That wasn't the purpose of that orphanage at all. In fact, they had other orphanages that they were running that were for the children that could be uh, adopted. But um, as it would have, as Sergeant Cook took me, and, and I think it was very courageous of him 
as an enlisted person to ask his commanders to allow me to live on post. And at that time, I knew no other children on the post. Um, was with him for about six months from just before Thanksgiving. And the way I know that because it, the people were getting their fruitcakes and things like that, you know, they were celebrations. It could have been around Christmas, just before Christmas. Uh, then around June, we came back to the United States and it was a cultural shock. Um, but one I just took in passively and when we ended up where we were living, um, it was June, school was just ending. And I had a sibling there who took me to school. And that was the first time I had seen so many children, you know, children that I, faces that I was not familiar with. It was, it was basically on Stanton Row in Southeast Washington. It was in the housing projects. And we were, I was introduced to the other children. I had no language skills. I couldn't speak Korean. I couldn't speak English, just no language skills at all. But anyway, I started school in the, in the fall. And as you say, started assimilating into the American culture. It, it was a little difficult, but after being institutionalized for, you know, whatever the six years, uh, you know, you just learn to go with the flow, so to speak. So uh, over the years, um, I was basically in an Afri African-American community. And what stood out was that I did look quite different. For some reason, people thought I was Chinese. I mean, I, probably not knowing any geography, I didn't really know. It, it didn't bother me. It never bothered me. But it was always pointed out that I that I was different, I looked different. And, uh, but basically just found it to, you know, find it. I just basically assimilated to the African-American culture. And that was what I knew all, all my life right there from that point on. Uh, no, no one ever spoke about Korea. No one ever spoke about anything of my past from that day forward, the day that Sergeant Cook took me to that military post to live. And what I know uh, you go at length in the, in the film, um, Deanne records this, uh, where you talk about a, a kind of a lonely and kind of isolated childhood because you felt mm -hmm. this difference, um, but yet you persevered and you kind of like worked really hard and then um, you uh, went to good schools and um, yeah, you know, I, um, you know, you have to go back to, I mean, 60, over 60 years ago. Um, at that time, I really didn't see anyone else that looked like me. And unfortunately, I was living in a, um, a family that uh, really didn't address, you know, did not address the issue of adoption, did not address anything about my past. There, there was no reinforcement of anything as far as cultural. You just took things, um, you know, there, there was just no discussion. And uh, even though I knew I was different, uh, one of the things I had an extreme, I had a lot of difficulties with language. Fortunately, I could read mentally, but I could not pronounce words. So, and the other fortunate thing was I was in the public school system of the District of Columbia and in the inner city. And basically, if you kept quiet, you're gonna move along. That's really about it. So there was no need for me to verbalize anything to anyone, just moved along and at some point, about the ninth grade, I realized I had to take the education, my education into my own hands. So I was on a mission from that day forward too. I, I attended Douglas Junior High School in uh, Southeast Washington. And once I found out that I could, uh, it was there that I found out about the um, 
going to college. And that was through the ABC program. And that was a turning point in my life because prior to that, I, I didn't know anything about going to college or anything like that. But um, everything, everything worked out. And then why in college at Union College in Schenectady, New York, attending there, that was when I realized I didn't have, I, I wasn't a citizen and I couldn't accept the scholarships. So I went back and got my uh, citizenship. And I understand that that was quite common that many people were adopted and did not, uh, you know, obtain citizenship. But um, everything, everything worked out. I worked very diligently, worked in, uh, to try to improve my speech and language skills. So um, after that, in fact, it's very funny. When I chose to go to law school, I never, I mean, to medical school, I kind of thought a little bit that I would like to go into law, but I noticed everyone had to talk a lot. And I said, mm, I, can't, I can't speak that much. So um, I can't pronounce these words. I couldn't remember cases. Um, so I just thought medicine would be the best route for me. And un, um, it's ironic now, I'm in a subspecialty of, radi uh, of radiology, which requires a lot of speaking. So, but anyway, <laughs> it, everything worked out all right. Yes, I, I mean, I, I, I'm just so impressed and admiring um, like what you must have gone through uh, in this very unique childhood, um, yeah, in that time period. So I, I feel like I feel like you're a great uh, ambassador to talk about this experience of adoptees. I understand why Deanne wanted to spotlight you, and just in contrast to the other three, the other three um, uh, um, adoptees are full Koreans, and they were adopted out to you know, Minnesota, uh, Jane in Minnesota, uh, mm -hmm. Daewon in uh, Switzerland, and then uh, Nina Kim in Sweden. So these mm -hmm. are the, uh, just for folks tuning in, uh, these are the other subjects and they're full Korean uh, adoptees. Um, you're, you're the one who's mixed race. And I just wanted to talk about the context of that in, that's highlighted in Yen's documentary. You know, talk about just like the, the legacy of Japanese colonialism and then just like the, the, the battle of the Cold War ideology in that, in that time period. And then how mixed race children, how do they fit into this, um, like larger cultural dialogue where they were, um, I think, because Korea was just embarking on this like, uh, how do you say, nationalist agenda. They were really concerned about mixed race children being part of the society. And that was, it was, it was just, it was just reminded them of American uh, like uh, occupation and domination. And the idea was to kind of maybe prioritize uh, the adoption out of mixed race kids because they would, with the notion that they would be better off like in um, in foreign countries with their fathers. Uh, um, was that, I mean, can you talk about, uh, Deanne, can you talk a little bit about um, the discussion of that in, in, mm -hmm. in the sure. film and also in the histories you've learned, you, you've read and studied to make your documentary? So um, yeah, the Korean War, you know, which was from, I mean, technically the war hasn't ended, but the, the fighting took place from 1950 to 53. And it was really the first hot war of the Cold War. And um, 15, 16 nations, um, it was the first UN um, force, military force that came uh, uh, you know, to, to fight communism really. And uh, so it was United States and South Korea, and then these other nations that sent troops although the US was the largest contingent. Um, and then um, countries like Sweden um, and um, Denmark sent medical personnel. So they had field hospitals and nurses. And so um, uh, the mixed race children who um, started appearing in, Korea was um, really a homogeneous nation. And um, so when the, mixed race children started appearing, um, there was concern about what what would happen to them. And reports of children being um, mistreated, um, you know, sometimes tossed away. Uh, and 
the thing was that, you know, they were generally, um, well, the, the other part of the whole thing with the Korean War and the post-war um, presence of US troops in South Korea is that, um, you know, there were these um, areas around the US military bases that were called um, Gijichon or military camp towns, which um, provided, you know, uh, entertainment and various services for the um, servicemen, including um, prostitution. And so some of the women, uh, you know, were um, engaged in sex work who, ha who had mixed race kids. Some of the women were engaged in actual like romantic relationships um, and, um, you know, sometimes married um, their, the, the men that they were um, involved with. Um, but anyway, in the early years, the uh, mixed race children, the babies were um, uh, quite treated badly. And Sigmund Rhee, who was um, president at the time, you know, was um, uh, noted as saying that, you know, we had, that the country had to get rid of them, even if they had to throw them into the Pacific Ocean. And so um, the, the, um, the social service agencies that like World Vision, you know, in Korea really looked at this problem and, and tried to um, find a solution through transnational adoption, um, kind of as the as the primary. I don't think that adoption, transnational adoption necessarily had to happen, um, but it, 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 I think it was, a, it was a combination of factors that you sort of see in the film play out. You know, it's like the lack of availability of healthy children, healthy white children here in the US, um, the interest in mixed race children from Harry Holtz, um, uh, his first plane load of eight children that he brought to the US and all the publicity that he received. Um, so um, it, it kind of snowballed into this massive sort of, you know, program. And Estelle was really the part of the first generation um, as, uh, you know, uh, as a child born right after the war. I mean, your, your um, birth date is, you know, there's multiple birth dates, just like I have multiple birth dates. Um, but, um, you know, the first, first wave of mixed race children um, uh, were adopted to the US and in, in many ways kind of assimilated and, and, you know, kind of disappeared from discussion. Uh, and uh, then the largest wave of uh, Korean, full Korean children really came in later years um, in the 70s and 80s. And um, so I think that, I, I feel like right now, the first generation, the early generation, Estelle's generation, and in some ways my own generation, um, that generation is really finding a voice right now and starting to you know really open up and, and tell their stories. And um, I think it's, really fascinating because it it um there's stories like Estelle's story really is um goes to the heart of this interrelationship between the United States and and South Korea and the the very intimate ways in which the two nations are you know have been connected uh and um anyway it, it's it's a it's a very interesting history <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's so, there's so much of, it, of this history that's so in-depth in your documentary that I, I, I we will, you know, we will only glean a bit of it today in today's conversation, but I mean, I, I'm just really fascinated by how the, the different political change and the cultural changes in Korea affected the transnational adoption, uh, and then the dismantling of the Hojuk, um, the mm -hmm. family registry system, right. I think that that was only in 2008. Um, mm -hmm. um, that no doubt impacted like mm -hmm. um, adoption from Korea. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, no, I, I just, something that I feel like your, your documentary really um, imp very importantly addresses um, and something that I don't think he, it's not very, it, it's not in the public consciousness. I think there's awareness of Korean adoption, the, the, the history mm -hmm. and how, a little bit about the history, why that's so much, why that was um, uh, something that was happening from uh, Korea to the U.S. predominantly, uh, mm -hmm. but that other his that historical context, um, I don't think is very, very, very uh, known um, outside of schol uh, scholarly circles. So I'm glad you have this film uh, is able to illuminate that. So with, with Estelle's story, I, I just wanted to go back to her for a bit. Like I, I we see you. Um, going, you finally, as an adult, you're obviously, you're like, um, I, I want to connect with my Korean heritage. 
So what was, you know, the process of, we see footage of you going back to Korea and you're trying to trace your birth records. And this is where we discover a bit about um, your birth, when you find your birth certificate and you find a little bit, find out a little bit about the circumstances of your, your uh, being put into an orphanage. Um, can you, can you, either both of you talk about a little bit about that, maybe Estelle first, talk about that, going on that journey to oh. Korea. Uh, thank you, uh, Lindy. It it was a long process. Uh, meaning, I had started when I was in college, and I first of all going back, I wanted to uh, add on to what Deanne was speaking about. What is of interest now, looking back, and after having the opportunity to have my relationship with uh, Deanne and other. Uh, Korean adoptees. What I'm particularly uh, interested in is the number of African American families who also adopted mixed race children. And that would be another entire subject matter mm -hmm. to cover. But over the years, spending time with Deanne, I have had the opportunity to meet a lot of families. And I'm just really you know, just really surprised, was surprised to see the number of African-American families uh, adopting the mixed race children as well. But anyway, going back to what you're saying about that particular journey, that journey actually began in my mind uh, when I entered college and I tried and I had very limited means, very limited means. I grew up in a, you know, home, very, very, really relatively low income, just low income. So I never thought about it until I entered college and I thought I would like to find out a little bit more. And while I was in college, it was also difficult, not only in time, but acceptance. That's when I first realized that there was something wrong because I went to Korean churches and um, you, know, you weren't welcome there at all. I, I was given a Bible at one of the churches. Um, and over the years, I was very busy with my education, but eventually about, about 15 years ago or so, you know, about 20 years ago, I kept searching and searching. And this is how I ended up meeting Deanne about, it's been now a good 14 years ago at the Smithsonian at one of the um, film series on Asian studies. And I am so grateful that Deanne took my story and helped me, you know, gave voice to my story. I, I'm very grateful to her. In the meantime, also happened to meet uh, other members of the community. And I just have to mention Ming Young, who, uh, me in Korea, um, a nonprofit oh, organization they, called Me in Korea. Yeah. Right. Who helped me, who kind of understood my plight because I was so unsophisticated. I'm I'm I was thinking that more Koreans or South Koreans would understand English. I had been there several times and you can't go, you can't go forward. I mean, you just need to have someone who can speak Korean. And uh she helped me and also I had to jaw my memory because I, I just knew that the story that I was given by the nuns was not true. I was told that I was dropped off in a basket. But I remember walking into that orphanage. So I wanted to know where did I walk into that orphanage from? I remember other little children beside me. And every time I would go back to visit the nuns, and this was a, a particular nun who had been there when I was a child. She said, no, my mother had dropped me. I wanted to know about my name. She said she had given me my name. Oh, it was just, this is a story that they like to create. So I knew, I remember the terrain. I remember the weather. I remember the, the um, skyline. And eventually I figured out I had to have come from the Southern part of the country because just study military um, science, Korea was known for the cold weather. This is where we learned the United States 
learn about fighting in the uh, cold weather. So I don't remember it being so, so cold unless I was in the house all the time. But anyway, I figured I was from the South and I was able to give this information to Ning Yong, who then investigated orphanages that had mixed children. There were certain orphanages that were uh, predominantly for mixed children. And then she found some records. We did go on that journey a few years ago, Christmas, oh, excuse me, New Year's Day, right after New Year's Day, we flew there and after she had done a lot of the footwork and found two orphanages that I was associated with. And I, I couldn't begin to tell you how I felt when I opened up one of the photo albums and saw a picture of myself right there doing what I usually am doing by myself, rumping around at the, uh, at the feet of the nuns, you know? Um, and I knew that that was me. I mean, I, as soon as I saw the picture, for, because my father had made a picture of me on fabric from that same photo. And so, um, and after that, just piecing my life together, it, it was just a wonderful feeling, just a wonderful feeling. So I am very grateful to Deanne. I'm very grateful to the rest of the mixed race community because I've been able to join them and listen to their, their stories and the other Korean adoptees. And, you know, Mion was just invaluable to me, just invaluable. And that is a wonderful feeling that after you reach a half a century, over a half a century, that you can say, you know where you came from, you know where your folks were, you know, uh, you know, you, you know the soil. I mean, I, I could describe the orphanage to the T and I had the opportunity to go back to that particular place, even though it wasn't an orphanage any longer. But I knew the way the water drained. I knew what kind of soil was there. And it was all, it was all the same, so to speak. Uh, that's, that's incredible. I just wanted to mention a quick thing that's in the chat. Um, there is a, a historian named Corey Graves who wrote a book called um, A Warborn Family, uh, African-American Adoption in the Wake of the Korean War. And um, it's actually amazing stories. Um, and she's an uh, incredible historian. Um, I think that this is an aspect of what, you know, what Estelle said earlier in terms of African American families, military families and non-military families that adopted mixed race kids out of the Korean War and also mixed race children from Germany too and elsewhere, I think. Um, uh, I think it's a part of our history that is starting to come out more, um, that we, that um, is, is fascinating and that we should learn more about. Um, and um, I'm hoping that Corey's book will help do that. I'm also working on another film about um, this aspect of our history, which is you know the experience of the mixed race um, adoptees and uh, the community of mixed race adoptees that um, are active is just incredible. Um, there's the book that Estelle was part of. Um, Estelle, what, what's the? Do you want to talk about that book real quick? No, no, the, um, the book, um, you know, I cannot, you know, I, you caught me off guard. I don't know. Okay. The name. It's a, anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 it's a book um, by um, mixed race Korean mm -hmm. adoptees and there's a new volume coming out this fall. So um, I think if you just Google it, you'll be able to find it. But um, anyway, it's a very vibrant community that uh, is discovering many things about our collective history. Um, Thank you so for sharing that, and thank you for that um, those uh, that insight um, uh, and information about the, the scholarship being done about mixed race uh, children that have been adopted transnationally, especially in the context of the Korean War. Um, I, I wanted to also kind of ask a little bit more about the, kind of this, this particular project as um, uh, and its use and and active advocating and um, for. Uh, greater public knowledge of this history and and, and it's, it's it's potential as an activist tool to kind of like influence government and and in the case of like um, I guess the South Korean government and their handling now moving forward of mm -hmm. um, like mixed race kids or even uh, full adopt 
Korean adoptees who come to them and ask um, and, and come uh, inquiring about their um, uh, the origins of their birth and their adoption. So like, um, and because you had to, Estelle, you had to go back to Korea and you proactively went, like, you know, to, you did all the detective work um, mm -hmm. to find out about your your um, your your um, origins there. But um, I feel like this this work, this film will help, will, will no doubt help uh, in uh, uh, educating folks about, especially those in government, about how to better um, facilitate this process for adoptees. So that leads me to just like maybe um, uh, the question about like your other subjects and their their kind of activism. Like you see that like Jane, who's, who's the adoptee in Minnesota and uh, Daewon, who's in Switzerland, they both started nonprofit initiative. One is called Track and Goal. And uh, we don't have too much time to go into that, but they basically have become advocates for um, Korean adoptees and their families, like in the case of Jane, like support, uh, advocating for single mothers. The single mothers uh, as, uh, were stigmatized um, uh, and were not given, I guess, the same rights um, as families for, you know, like uh, keeping children. Um, and in the case of Daewon's uh, nonprofit was trying to like his adoption experience and him kind of working through it psychologically over the years helped him like made him want to be this advocate for like connecting children with their lost families can you talk about the how you see do you at least uh, talk about these organizations and how you see your film kind of being used as a potential activist tool mm -hmm. yeah. um yeah uh day one wasn't the founder of goal global overseas adoptees like he was um he came later and was the secretary general for a number of years and was very active in the um, work in trying to uh, include uh, Korean adoptees in the um, uh, dual citizenship effort. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think that in some ways I, I see all of the people, uh, adoptees in the film, um, evolving to have um, not only, you know, find out about their own personal stories, but but then kind of um, having a, a, an impact in the greater adoptee rights arena, um, including Estelle, who is, was, you were a board member of this group called the 325 Camera, yes, Korean yes. American Mixed Race Adoptees, which um, formed out of the, uh, the conference here in Berkeley that focused on camp towns and um, mixed race adoptees. Um, and that organization is involved in helping match up um, adoptees with uh, through DNA with their birth families. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I would I would love the film to be uh, used as a way of educating our community um, and the public at large, both um, adoptees, adoptive families, as well as Korean families and Korean society to uh, continue to um, build our collective knowledge, but also continue to improve policies that um, you know, support children and single mothers. Um, Jane Trenka and the, the organization of, um, that she worked with, um, TRAC, Truth and Reconciliation for the Adopted Community of Korea, um, you know, I think was really um, at the forefront of, of um, trying to identify what had happened with um, Korean adoption in looking at the broader, broader po political, social, economic dimensions and really doing an analysis along with an organization called Ask Adoptee Solidarity Korea that Kim Stoker was, was part of. Um, I remember meeting both um, Kim Stoker and Jane Trenka um, years ago when, you know, they, it was really the first time I think I met them in 2000, which I can't believe that was 20 years ago, um, at a, uh, around 2000 in, in Korea when um, there was the first gathering of Korean adoptees in Seoul and 400 adopt, around 400 adoptees from all over the world um, converged at this gathering in Seoul. And um, this was when ASK was just starting to form and TRAC you know, came along soon after that. And um, it was really thrilling to, um, sit around in a room and listen to 
adopted individuals like myself start to grasp um, the historical context in which adoption, you know, developed and um, to try to understand the, all the various forces that um, brought us together and also to connect the dots in terms of, you know, why, why um, were so many uh, adoptees sent overseas? Um, why were there so many false records? Um, you know, these stories of adoptees who um, were searching for their families and who had a lot of different challenges um, dealing with adoption agencies, the government, um, the police, you know, very, all the various players um, and uh, the community coming together to try to support, um, support individuals, you know, looking for their families and so on. So it was, it's, it's really, um, I think, I think it's, it's really, you know, looking back on it, I, I do think it's a process of a community that happened to have this thing happen to them where we had absolutely no control at all. Uh, and then gradually coming to a consciousness about what happened to us and um, trying to at last influence the future, um, not only the present, but the future. And, um, and then this sort of blossoming of this community, this alliance between adoptees, um, Korean adoptees and unwed mothers um, and um, trying to support you know, the rights of single mothers who want to parent their um, their children um, and their ability to keep them. So I, I, I feel like that um, that part of um, the adopt, Korean adoptee experience continues to evolve. Um, this organization called CoRoot in, um, in Korea, in Seoul, um, along with um, Korean Unwed Mothers and Fam Kumpa, Korean Unwed Mothers Association, and a variety of other um, organizations have been doing a series of dialogues with adoptees. And also they held their first um, Adoption Truth Day um, this year. And, I, and the group is calling for um, a truth and reconciliation process uh, and a variety of other you know, actions. But I, I do think that the community has, it's a time of to um, reckon with our, our history and to engage with um, the Korean society at large, with ad adoptive families, not only with among adoptees, but adoptive families and Korean society, civil society and um, lawmakers and um, to really understand and uh, look at the systematic or systemic ways in which children were orphanized <laughs> and, um, and put into this system of adoption that really became um, kind of what I call industrial ado industrialized adoption. Well, I mean, uh, thank you for sharing that that very like in depth history of like Korean adoption and that you found in your research uh, in not only crafting this particular project but also your previous work, uh, your previous documentary around around the subject. So I, I, I just, I learned a lot and I know our audience did too, and I think would want to check out your film. Um, I, I also wanted to be mindful of our time and just like to make sure I address some of the questions. Uh, I think um, uh, there's a, one thing I'm, I, I actually want to like get in here was to just ask a little bit about the reception of the film since you've um, debuted it last year at, at CAMFest. Um, and its circulation in the AAPI festival circuit and also beyond. And um, I, I don't, you know, like how, how, what have you, in terms of what you were able to gauge, what was the, uh, how did people feel about the, the film, especially Korean adoptees in attendance um, in, in the AAPI space, but also I, I, that's for you, Deanne, and also for Estelle, in your, in, in the African-American community that you're part of, uh, where you live and have people been able to see it? What was your family, your friends, your work colleagues? Uh, how, how was the reception there? Um, so Deanne, can you quickly sure. uh, mention yeah. that? Yeah, um, well, the festival circuit got a little bit interrupted through uh, because of the pandemic, but the reception has been really great. I think, um, especially among adoptees, um, I think, um, you know, hopefully with the, uh, uh, <laughs> Hopefully with the broadcast, we'll reach more people and um, have an opportunity to, to engage in more discussions. I, I also want to just say that that book that um, Estelle and I were talking about is called um, Mixed 
Koreans our stories. So check it out if you're interested. And Estelle, has people been able to see your film over your people <laughs> in your community? Oh, yes, we had the opportunity uh, to show it at Howard University uh, at a reception and um, the local Korean uh, organizations helped to sponsor it and it was well received. And um, as far as the African-American community, it has been well received. The people are very interested um, because as you know, many African-Americans are admixture uh, people. So as far as mixed race, it's not any big news, but I think just to know um, that so many African-American families did, uh, did um, adopt children from Korea. And um, these are not, these are not their offsprings. These were just uh, children that happened to be in the orphanages. And, um, but it's been, I, I think not only the film, but the entire story has been well received. And this is a project that's been going on with Deanne for, oh, 14 years. <laughs> I think you saw me, I, I think I was just rolling out of puberty when she picked me up. <laughs> That's so wonderful to hear. Um, I, I want to thank you both for joining us today. I wish we had more time to talk at length, but I'm so happy to hear that this film is getting that kind of reception. And I know it's going to go moving forward. It's going to have a, a lot of um, interest from various communities that we've touched upon, the academic community, documentary community, the different, you know, it's very, it's, it's, it's it will function kind of in the educational space. Also, I feel like uh, in the activist space. So uh, I want to thank um, thank everyone for joining us today, I, our audience, and I want to remind you that uh, Geographies of Kinship is streaming right now um, at uh, our festival uh, platform. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. Uh, it the, view, the viewing window closes this Sunday night at 11.59 uh, p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time here. Uh, so if you enjoyed our conversation today and our festival lineup, I want to encourage you to donate to Visual Communications. As I said, we're celebrating our 50th year and that your support will help sustain our year round um, operations and programming. So if you want, you're interested in doing that, go to our website at vcmedia.org for more information. I hope you will stay, stick around for more artist conversation we have coming up as uh, we have a couple more today, Connections and Cinema uh, Musica. So if you want updates for the festivals, you can go to festival.vc media.org and you can follow our social media accounts at uh, VC Film Festival and then you can tag us on hashtag LAAPFF2020 uh, and on that note I want to conclude our conversations tonight today and I want to thank you both for joining us uh, it's such an honor to meet with you guys very very accomplished ladies um, and I wish you well and take care and be safe in this time have have an early holiday season, good holiday season. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Really. Appreciate so much. it. Yeah. Have a rest of a great festival. Thank you. We, Thank we, you. we will do. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. -bye.